I'm, uh, my name is Karandeep Singh. I'm one of the faculty members in the Department of Learning Health Sciences and excited to welcome you all to the uh, 2023 to 2024 LHS Collaboratory Seminar Series. Um, this year's theme, uh, I know some of you may have attended our kickoff, this year's theme is putting artificial intelligence and machine learning into practice, where we're going to be talking about some of the translational issues of actually trying to use AI and machine learning in clinical settings. Um, and I think we, I'm delighted to have Dr. Eva Steiberg here to kind of kick things off with, uh, with this, uh, this year's theme. Um, a couple of housekeeping items, so really excited to have you here to, uh, today. Today's session is being recorded, um, and the slides and recording will be available on the LHS Collaboratory website archive, where you can also uh, get access to our prior uh, presentations. Um, we'll start off by having Dr. Starberg give a talk, and I think he may pause to actually ask if you guys have clarifying questions, so feel free to you know, engage during the talk. At the end of it, we'll have uh, if we've got time left over, we'll have a you know, kind of dedicated Q&A session where we'll be passing along a mic. Uh, just make sure to talk into a mic, and if you don't, I'll ask Dr. Steiberg to just repeat your question on the mic so that folks who are listening to the recording can hear. So I'm very excited to have Dr. Ivat Steiberg here. Um, he is the Professor of Clinical Biostatistics and Medical Decision Making at Leiden University Medical Center. Um, he's also the chair of the Department of Biomedical Sciences. And just to give you a sense of like how excited I am, um, it's not just that he has 150,000 citations um, what, or that he has a Wikipedia page that you should check out and look at the, the last sentence, um, which was surprising to me, but it turns out it was his students who put that up there um, and put him up to it. What actually is really cool is when I was first getting interested in the space of risk prediction, I went to several folks and said, what book should I read? All of the kind of biostats epi courses I had had were really focused around inference. And several folks said, you have to read this book called Clinical Prediction Models by Dr. Steyerberg. And so I said, okay, you know, once three people have recommended a book, you say, okay, I gotta read this book. So I read this book cover to cover and was really eye-opening. It was written in a really accessible way. Um, introduce people to the field and all the various issues around, um, you know, kind of prediction modeling and how to look at measuring performance and whether something is good enough to actually use, which is the question that we often actually think about and probably is the most important question. And I remember, you know, I think ha having finished this book thinking it'd be great if there was more emphasis on some machine learning stuff, some more, you know, model updating stuff. And then in 2019, his second edition came out, which filled that gap. And so then I read that one cover to cover. And so I think just like some of the most clear writing, I think, in terms of how to do prediction modeling and how to interpret it and how to incorporate those things in a clinical practice. So thank you so much, Dr. Steiberg. Really excited to have you here and hear your talk on the trustworthiness of predictions for individual patients. Uh, uh, so, okay, so, well, th thank you so much. This mic works, right? And uh, so, so thanks for the introduction. It, it's really, uh, a bit intimidating if you talk uh, address all that. And uh, but um, let me first thank you uh, for, for organizing this session. It looks really great to have uh, yeah this kind of informal uh, table-wise setup. And of course, uh, lunch helps a lot to uh, keep, uh, make people happy, feel them uh, okay. Um, Karen Deep or Karen Deep, I don't know Karen Deep. I would say in Dutch, but it's all the same direction. I brought you a small present from Netherlands. Do not forget that this was, was a Dutch visitor, and actually quite some Dutch people here. We were talking half of the time Dutch this morning already. But so here you go. <laughs> uh, so to talk my uh, start my talk more more seriously, um, and then yeah, I, I work in uh, at, at Leiden University, and uh, yeah, since it's so really old, and I like this this uh, historic building. This is the Academy, Academy building. I graduated there in 91, and now I can walk around there as a professor, so that that's really makes me feel very, very nice and I go there. Today we are here in Michigan, and uh, Anna Kahl, a PhD student uh, working here for some time, uh, already took us around a bit in, uh, uh, this is downtown, I guess, I've not, not really seen this, not, not consciously at least, uh, but it's probably a very nice place. So I'm talking about what I really like for many, many years, and I've been involved uh, since I was a medical student uh, initially, and then the bi biomedical sciences in 1988. I made my first prediction model, a bit of a heroic effort in uh, testicular cancer patients. There were something like 100 patients, 100 men, 11 died. 
And of course, I wanted to make a prediction model. Who were these guys? So we came up with something that in retrospect, I think uh, I should not have attempted, right? 11 events is just too little. But anyway, we, have in the, we are now in a time where data sets grow and more is possible. AI is very, um, very much advertised, very much available to many people. Um, and we, these models come up more and more. We learn more about biology. That also helps, of course. So here is a site on, uh, uh, that was up and running. It is not anymore on cancer, cancercalculators.org where they uh, present the, the, the opening page like this, and it's kind of the picture that uh, this is probably the male, very trustworthy doctor uh, talking to a woman with breast cancer, I guess, but it is not explicitly stated. And they say we present uh, these models here to support communication and understanding. Uh, some of the tools can be used to support shared decision making. It's also a buzzword, right, in cancer patients. So that is the ambition that we really want to bring these models to practice. We want to give uh, do the shared decision making, uh, support uh, people with cancer in this case. And there's another site that is working. This is the evidentio.com. It's an initiative I do like where you can upload your model and it is presented in a relatively easily accessible way. And uh, oncology is in the top uh, with 182 models in that field. Surgery also has a lot of uh, models. And then uh, cardiology, that are the top three. No, not unexpected, I guess. So are these models uh, trustworthy? And that is a, a question I want to discuss today. So uh, some of the models I was involved in are up there. So this is one in um, pancreatic cancer, and the model prediction for three-year survival, developed in Amsterdam, externally validated. So that is the, the trick, I think. Externally validated 3,000 patients from eight countries, including the US. Uh, so is this trustworthy, right? Validated. So it has kind of a stamp on it. Huh? That, um, but we may doubt, of course, whether that's really then sufficient. And another stamp may be whether it's CE certified. And none were of the model. I had, I had 20 models there, and none were <laughs> CE certified. There are some ideas on, on how to develop these, uh, these models uh, through different stages. So we did a review of what people had written about that and came up with a guidance document. It's in Dutch, actually, the Veld Norm Medische AI, Medical uh, Artificial Intelligence. So starting with issues that you need to be very careful of the data preparation as the first step. When you, and this is either you want to start developing a model or take something off the shelf. So in Leiden University, we, get really, we have many companies, many initiative startups. They say, they have, we have this great prediction model for you. Do you want to implement that to deploy it? in your setting. So then the data in the EPD, getting that right is one important phase. Development, if you start developing something yourself, validate it, uh, be careful with the software implementation, spe specifically for AI, I think, at point of attention. Impact assessment, so do we make different decisions? And can we claim that outcomes improve with the system rather than without? And then eventually implementation, so also some additional hurdles um, May, may occur there are some barriers and also some facilitators. So talking about um, trustworthiness, I um, yeah I thought this is a I didn't anticipate that many people, but um, many experts from the field. So I need to prepare. I did an extensive uh, Google search, and there's not much about this. There's one paper that has relatively many citations, and one one over uh, over 100 from uh, a respectable journal. So. Uh, Look at this typesetting, the British Journal of Philosophy of Science. So this must be really good. It looks trustworthy to me, right? Um, and it had some really nice ideas about how to get predictions and to judge um, the validity of that and trustworthiness. So what the claim is that this uh, is always single author, huh? this is the Dr. Morton says, well, we need these mathematical models for, for complex processes. We want to make predictions for complex processes but there's no simple prediction possible. So then we have to resort to these models. There's no way out. And then on the other hand, we make assumptions. And he says, well, all sensible people know these are false. That's actually interesting because in statistics, we really have this habit of testing assumptions. First. If I make a Cox regression model, proportional hazards model for survival, I think Terry will also say, well, it's maybe not that bad that you test proportionality assumption. 
And, but, but, we, but beforehand, I already know it will not fully hold. And we can also be very specific here that it can only hold for one specific model. If you add a covariate, it's not uh, tenable anymore. But uh, that's a detail. Uh, the general point, we have to make assumptions, and they are only yeah, intelligent guesswork. That's what he says. So if I think about the medical predictions I've been involved in, it's essentially always some outcome and why that is dependent that there's a relation to a set of x variables. Well, this is, of course, an oversimplification. If you just write this, this is the, the only formula in the first part, <laughs> y a function of x. But between these x's, there can, of course, be all kinds of nonlinearities and interactions. So it's very complex to model that um, in a plausible way, and probably it's always some, to some extent wrong. But it may still be useful, as we know. So that is the uh, way I look at this. So this is a background. Um, I'm going to address three broad topics on trustworthiness. So uh, what do we need for individual patients? Something on validity, uh, some measures that we may use there. Um, then something on the role of AI and humans in making these models, uh, the requirements that, that we may uh, ask. And then the third part will be a bit more by statistics on, on quantifying sources of uncertainty. So the first part is what do we need? Well, validity, right? that is the really the classic way of, of dealing with that is uh, if I don't have a external validation study, only internal, so I have a particular data set, say of Michigan, and I do some cross validation or some bootstrap kind of tricks, but only for Michigan, then it would be uh, in principle not a really high ranking journal. But if I have, have say data from other hospitals uh, across the country, then I may really end up in a top journal. I think in the past, people really uh, would reject in the big journals a paper with only uh, one particular setting for development. So how may that work out? So this is an example in neurotrauma. I also show that later in more detail, uh, where we did some external validation. On the x-axis here, we have the predictions made from one uh, data set, the impact data set. And on the y-axis, we have the observed outcomes in another data set in the crash trial. That was a mega trial in the run from the UK, uh, from London, uh, something uh, several thousands of patients. So we see rather small confidence intervals around it. And this is really, yeah, in retrospect, I think this is too good to be true. Really, being on the 45 degree line, that's rarely seen. But apparently here, uh, we did that. Uh, we achieved that. And we had a different variant of the model, the core model, which was a bit over predicting. If we say 40% predicted, on average, something like 30% observed. So, and that is a common phenomenon that uh, this average risk does not correspond well uh, when we validate. But in principle, this is the kind of thing that, that, that um, yeah, would build trust in predictions that you can show it uh, works in different settings. Well, what about this then? So I was in a thesis committee. This is five weeks ago, and the overall model was well calibrated. But then in the appendix eight, there was this uh, graphic. So it uses a nice uh, trick that I really would advocate, is internal, external. So they had five sites, and they drop one each time for the development of a model based on the other four. So if you do that for the first, they had the predictions on the x-axis from the four sites and validate in center A, but this is really off, right? And there's a conference interval around it here, so it's, yeah, this is really dramatic. And uh, here, I don't know what's happening. It's really, well, yeah, extremely poor. Here, it may be reasonable, reasonable, and, and yeah, strange. So the overall conclusion would be this is a nice model, but if you look by sight, it's really crazy. And it's really very, very bad. So I think it's, yeah. Uh, they put it in Appendix 8, so I didn't really check on what, what to do with the conclusion, eh? because you could say this appendix data, they invalidate the whole attempt to make a model for this, uh, this context. Uh, finally, uh, 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 some, some perspective. Uh, we have uh, internal validity. That is what anyone should aim for developing a model. It should at least be internally valid. And then going to external validity, there are different degrees. We had some de debate temporal generalizability is, a, is also relatively easy to achieve. You just uh, have more recent data from the same setting, from the same context, from the same hospital. And then we had the fight, as you see here, which would be more important, a geographical generalizability 
or domain generalizability, general geographic going to different sites, or domain going to different disease areas. But both are, say, more more higher tests, more stronger tests for a model uh, to achieve. So to summarize where I am now, it, so uh, yeah, internal is the minimum, external of these different variants, an efficient way to do that, which I do see uh, being used more and more is this internal external trick. So a cross validation by site or by country or leave some parts out. So not at random, that's the main thing. I think in the AI world, is, I see a lot of papers who do still do random splits, and that is really uh, inefficient, stupid, don't do that. So to do a meaningful split. Yeah. Um, okay, then a uh, question. Well, I think people are still awake, even with the lunch. Um, but, but what is the most common measure that, that we see in prediction models? If you look for performance, what is everywhere? Any guesses, anyone wants to shout out? The AUC is here. Uh, you all agree with AUC, and Karen Deep knows everything. So AUC, yes, that's everywhere. They, uh, people really focus on that. The area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, the AUC, or concordance statistic. It's a measure for discrimination, the spread of the predictions, how much difference do we see between those with and without events and their predictions. So higher is a better, uh, if, if you achieve that if you have better predictors. If there's no information to make predictions, you have a low AUC. And the question to me is, and that's really maybe also it's puzzling to me, yeah? so do we really think that a higher value makes a model more trustworthy? Or maybe there's at least an upper limit. If I see a model prognostic model with, say, 0.98 would be very high, close to one, then I would be very suspicious and say they, they, they played the dirty trick. They put something in that is related strongly to the outcome because they were too close to that or so. So too high would make us suspicious, but there's this debate on the, uh, is there any threshold? Um, I think many people will like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So this is my colleague, uh, Ben van Kalster, who I'm working with for many, many years now. Uh, he searched a bit in the literature on what do people claim as a label with a different AUC value. Well, 0.5 is random, it's a coin flip. One is perfect. Um, the one I liked most and I got into a fight with Ben about is that there is this um, Cohen's D, so for small, medium, and moderate effects, uh, 0.2 standard deviation, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. That corresponds if to a, a AUC value of uh, 0 0.56, 0 0.64, and 0 0.71 here. So there is, if you believe the, the Cohen's D, then you should have these labels for AUC values. But uh, Ben wanted them to be out anyway, but <laughs> here it is still. Uh, this is by Stanley Lemishov, <laughs> big name in uh, logistic regression. He said, well, over 0.8 is excellent. Yeah, it's a pause here because everyone else says it's good. But he said, no, excellent, this is outstanding if you're above 0.9. That is all average for that, that, That's my main point. So, so claiming AUC values as trustworthy, et cetera, and, and, and labeling is difficult. Um, move to the other measure that is less often reported, but very important if you think about trustworthiness, that is the reliability of a prediction. If I say 10% risk, it should be on average 10%. Mm -hmm. So that is calibration that we really should look for. Uh, the true risk estimates, I uh, put that here, uh, utopian. We even put that in a title of a paper. And so you, you, we should not really think that we can really m precisely, exactly have the true model generating these outcomes, why? And it's always approximate. It is underreported, and especially in uh, this field of predictive analytics, um, we, we have some perspective on that. That's also actually with, uh, I see Jeremy is here, so the Stratos Initiative, that's one of the papers that we had from this uh, uh, collaboration. Okay, so this was uh, point one. I, 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 as I said with Karen uh, Deep, we might pause here if people, if I provoked people too much already, or not sufficiently, uh, please, please ask some, some questions or any comments. I welcome that. how we are counting on fragmentation. I don't think so, yeah, but I think you can pick up. <coughs> it's just a general question about evaluation metrics. Yes. So you mentioned that the AUC, we shouldn't count on it Yeah. on its own. And then the second thing, you recommend, recommended the utopia. 
or what, what was yeah, so, so the common measure that we see everywhere is AUC. Uh, yeah. And I think it is an important measure, but yeah. if we think about trustworthiness, it's far more important to look for calibration. If we predict a certain risk, do we also observe that. Okay, yeah. so in addition, not only the AUC or Not only AUC, calibration. but also calibration, and then uh, we may, in the discussion, maybe go on with other measures that, that capture the, the full picture for decision making and impact. And uh, Karen Deep says he advertises this net benefit measure always because he, he survived publishing a paper, right, with Andrew Vickers, who uh, really invented that measure in 2006. Uh, but that combines uh, for classification the true positives and false positives. And that depends on yeah, both discrimination and calibration. Yep. So show me. Continue. Oh, yeah, the sound is now uh, increased to uh, really making sure you don't fall asleep. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, some jokes in between. The trustworthiness of ChatGPT. There is, of course, a lot to do about uh, ChatGPT. And, um, yeah, there was a paper in, last week in Nature, I believe, that ChatGPT should write our grants. So that, that may help, may save us time in some sense. But uh, so I say, we know that it may be hallucinating. And that, that, that is an issue with, with AI. Eh? So how do we know, how can we trust AI? So I ask ChatGPT, can you do calculations? Of course, it's a very polite system, it's very nice. Of course, I can help you with, uh, with various types of calculations. What, what calculation would you like assistance with? Well, I just type in a number, this was really random, and uh, the, the product of this multiplied by that is, and it's a big number, so 16 billion, right, is it? But if you type this in your calculator, it is a different number, right? It is close, but it's clearly wrong. So I say this to Chet, hey, are you sure? Uh, apologies, let me correct that. Okay, again wrong. <laughs> and I say, my apologies, so I say, can you regen for earlier? Let me recalculate. So the correct product, so it claims correct. Eh? It does not say the approximate, it says correct answer. That by that is the, well, and again, so, so this is still off, right? So, so and that, that is the strange thing. That is the warning that, uh, message here, that, that uh, how to trust that. And that really is, of course, in, in related to what the evidence is, what, is, what the data were that were used for, for that. And for ChatGPT, it's a language model, so it's just integrating that. And for some things, it may be very good, for others not. Um, I, I'm still very confident, and I, I like ChatGPT, so I think, well, there may be other popular terms related to these issues of uh, how we deal with AI and bring it to the clinic, exactly the things that Karendeep said in the... Uh, at the start of this session, fairness, equity, and I said, well, but there's probably more, right? So I ask, and uh, what are the important ethical concerns regarding AI? Well, the, and then the answer very polite again, are numerous and evolving, okay? Uh, here are some important considerations. Okay, there we go. A list of five in total is 10, bias and fairness, privacy, uh, transparency and explainability, accountability, responsibility, autonomy and decision making, security, long term effects, unintended consequences, that's also a really big area, harm, informed consent, data quality and representativeness. I say, well, hey, that's kind of a really key issue to me. Uh, human augmentation versus replacement. Oh, but we already had autonomy. So I said, okay, can you group these? Yes, of course, I can. Uh, I can chat PPT. So now there are four groups, and at the bottom there is this autonomy and whole human augmentation is indeed combined now as saying human centric. There's accountability, responsibility, security is here. I, I guess I myself I would have placed it in number two, but, but the first is really data and model integrity, bias, fairness, data quality, representativeness, and transparency and explainability. So, Number one is what, what I would have maybe guessed, but there's far more to this. So that is nice by ChatGPT, I guess, that it really gives a kind of overview of everything it's found in the, in the web, in some sense. Okay, so then uh, move on to um, uh, model flexibility as a general issue, which AI can bring for us. So there is human oversight in the classical modeling. Uh, we need to think about if we make a prediction model on, on what predictors based on, we talk to clinicians, read the literature, or we just say what's available in the data, there are different schools there. Uh, you have to address non-linearity, so, so the, all kinds of functions and flexible forms are possible, also in regression, especially spline functions are really nice, I like them. 
interactions, include them or not. I think most published prediction models, really hundreds, few of them have interactions. M most ignore that. Uh, they just focus for the main effects in the regression. In AI, we also have made decisions to make on the modeling. Sorry, it's quite sensitive. So hyperparameter choices, you can optimize that by some, some resampling, uh, bootstrapping, cross-validation kind of stuff. Uh, the techniques, some may still love CART. Others may say, no, that's clearly outdated. We have random forest now, or no, the gradient boosting, XGBoost. And uh, personally, I, uh, I have some good experience with that. But also, some may still like neural nets. So there are schools there. And that, um, yeah, that, that impacts on trustworthiness. So this was just sent to me last week. This is October 12th. Reproducibility, 246, so nice large number. Biologists get different results from the same data. And they are not the first to do this. There were many studies in psychology and also in the medical field. So one that um, I, I often uh, refer to is this red cards issue, the red cards data set dark-skinned soccer players, and there's a paper, this is some years ago already, but there were 29 teams uh, collaborating, participating in this, this, this study, 61 analysts, they had the same data, same research questions, soccer referees are more likely to give red cards to dark-skinned toned players than light-skinned toned players. That was the question posed to them. And they give, they report odds ratios, I think this is just relative risks, uh, between say around one to 2.9. So yes, there would be this tendency to give more red cards to dark-skinned players. Uh, 20 had a statistically significant effect and nine none. If you would say as the first hurdle, it's that it's statistically significant. And actually, my, my second son is doing economics and uh, he's learning statistics. He said, ah, that's really easy. And so, oh, that's, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, I always thought it was very difficult. No, we did linear regression and uh, yeah, you first just test whether there's a relation, yes or no. So that is maybe the first hurdle right here, that nine had no significant association, so there is none or so, that is on the top here. So here are the teams, so 29, the effect estimates, odds ratios are here. Uh, point estimates with confidence interval, so nine are non-significant, overlapping the neutral value of one. And here is the 2.9 estimate, the most extreme, with a lot of uncertainty. So two errors here, right? That, is, that cannot be all odds ratios for these models. And, well, what is a zero odds ratio? It's minus infinity, right? So that should have been scaled a little bit different, but overall we see this pattern. That, that's the main point for now. So when I'm looking in more detail, uh, it's also confusing that some say, okay, we did Poisson regression. Okay, so I can imagine you have this number of cards in time that they are playing. So yeah, this make, doesn't make sense. Eh? Some form of uh, Poisson uh, distribution is not that strange. But the estimates are really wildly different. You see them, the, the one below one, but here large effects with the same term in the, in the model. My favorite procedure, logistic regression, also shows up everywhere, but Again, around one to really high estimates. And then the third, third issue related to the present talk about trustworthiness, they also claim a lot of trust. So here are confidence intervals really absent. And this is just, so if I am believing Dirichlet process Bayesian clustering, then it is a 1.71 and there is no uncertainty. Right? So that is... A uh, bit strange, a, a very strong Bayesian prior that it should be 1.7, and then you have data, but this, you ignore the data, right? So something like that's happening. Um, so why are these differences occurring? So there's different choices in technique, but especially in the different combination of covariates, that, that, that 21 unique combinations. So what to adjust for, what to take into account in the model, and they, their conclusion, literally, is uh, that variation in analysis of complex data may be difficult to avoid. Yes, even by experts. Well, there was, of course, comments that these were not truly experts. <laughs> I would have done it differently. But they had honest intentions. Eh? They were just given the data set with a research question. They did not have to collect the data or had a vested interest in that. No, they were just looking at this question. There is some irony. Uh, that they had to put a corrigendum to their own paper, that there uh, was uh, some small things were missing, but um, okay. Now, so this is on the uh, general point of um, differences between models and uncertainty arising from that. Uh, if something is explainable, does that make it more trustworthy? 
Um, so that's especially very popular now and important uh, in, in AI, explainable AI. Uh, so the definition I found is something like those. Okay, so algorithm is trustworthy if the predictions based uh, are, ba are based on factors that are acceptable to domain experts instead of on spurious correlations. So it asks us as humans to really separate what makes sense, uh, the reasonable input and reasonable characteristics versus spurious correlations. And yeah, I, I think many people here will have read this book, The Book of Why by, by Julia Pearl. I think he literally uses these spurious correlations as apparently statisticians were, were, were saying, yeah, that's spurious, they could easily see that, and then it was non-causal. And it was just by incidents, by, 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 by coincident, coincidental findings. They, these are spurious. So I think this is a bit difficult to really take seriously. Um, what I do like is this uh, development of the Shapley additive explanations, uh, the Shep values. I think we see that everywhere in the AI papers on prediction. And what does ChatGPT tell me? Well, using these values, researchers and practitioners, so also, I guess, doctors, then, can gain a deeper understanding on how different features influence model predictions, leading to improved model interpretability and trust. So because I, so I see that these red and blue colors shift to low values, then I understand why this prediction is, is given for that particular patient. Right? This patient has a low risk uh, because of that and that factor. So intuitively, yes, I do like that, but it's more a, a illustration, more a clarification than, than truly, um, yeah, I don't know, did, did, did we get into semantics, I guess, well, what is explaining then? But it's reflecting what is in the model. Um, and yes, it, it is happening, and I guess it, in principle, and we may have some de debate about this, about, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of quite of, kind of st standard now to put these values in uh, when you make a prediction model in AI, with AI techniques. So um, it was a bit on, on, on the processes, ChatGPT or other approaches in AI, uh, with the human factor there. Let me now move to uh, um, some, some more statistically oriented topics on, on components or aspects of uncertainty, right? unless there are immediate responses or questions or, you okay? <laughs> um, so, so uncertainty. Well, the classic thing, of course, from a statistical point is, is sample size. A larger sample size, we have more certainty and then more trustworthiness. If I publish, try to publish something in a big journal, in JAMA or so, and I would come with a model uh, like my testicular cancer example, 100 patients, no chance if I bring 10,000 to the table with 800 events rather than eight or so. Yes, that, 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 that would make, uh, um, have more trust and then be more reliable. And we have to realize, of course, that's the number of events. If we talk about binary uh, outcome prediction or survival, it is the events that, that make up for the effective sample size. Um, there's another concept I'd like to discuss, is, is this patient's like you and exceptionality, exceptionality for, of a patient. So how, how exceptional is the patient compared to the average? And that impacts on the uh, certainty we can have, on the trustworthiness of, of a prediction. So this concept of patients like you was used for risk communication, I illustrate that, uh, and we took that one step further now for, say, uncertainty communication, and that, um, and it's ongoing work. So this is uh, an example uh, by my friend uh, Michael Catan. Uh, he's at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he, uh, f as a joke, I think, but he himself said it, that he's the king of nomograms. He always makes these graphical displays. If you search for Catan nomogram, over 100 hits in uh, PubMed. Uh, he makes these models and presents them as nomograms for, especially in uh, prostate cancer, uro urology, but also many other fields. This is one of the more famous. Uh, for men with prostate cancer, nomogram predicts the presence of a small, moderately differentiated, uh, confined tumor, so an, an indolent tumor. I mean, prostate cancer, there's this worry about overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and this is then to say, okay, probably it's innocent, it's indolent cancer, so you will not need a surgery for that or radi radiotherapy. So he presented the nomogram. Uh, we are very simple. There are different variants. This is PSA. It's a strong factor here. It's a long uh, line here. 
uh, something like the Gleason score here, primary, secondary, and you add some points and you get a probability estimate. Now, how to communicate this probability? And it is written here, so I highlighted that. It says, uh, Mr. X, if we had 100 men exactly like you, you would expect, and then you have to fill in predicted probability times 100, to have indolent cancer. So if the risk is 10%, you would say 10 patients like you, 10 men like you. So there are two things. The one is that it's exactly like you. I think exact, I can discuss with Mike uh, whether he still agrees with that. It should be conditional on the covariates that we consider. It's only a kind of a profile. It's not exactly like you. This patient will be unique. It will be different in many respects. So exactly is a bit of too strong. And the other thing is that it states 100. And that, that was with some statistical colleagues. They, they really got excited by that because they're now, no, maybe this patient is really exceptional and there are not 100 patients like you, maybe only 10 or 20. So, um, and maybe another case, there may be 1,000 like you if you have a quite common covariate pattern. So this idea of uh, 100 men, men like you, we took that a bit further uh, with uh, another piece used in it, Duran Thomas uh, worked on that. We took as an example, just to illustrate the concept, uh, a data set that I worked with for quite a long time, this uh, Gusto one trial data uh, was run from Duke University and it's still used for research. That was run in, uh, was published in 93, so now we are 30 years later and still working with it. So that shows the richness of uh, having just a good real life example. 40,000 patients in total, 1,200 for this illustration. So what we do here is that we uh, consider this idea of what is the effective number of patients like you. And well, we have to define these by covariates. So here we have age and shock. And shock is a rare but strong predictor. And that is a problem that I've struggled with often. And often people have asked me, hey, should I include that in the model or should I drop it? And, and I think my initial idea would just be, well, look at the uh, you can test, of course, if there's an improvement in the log likelihood, if there's a chi-square uh, uh, test that has a low p-value, or the improvement in your model by some measure like r-squared, it is say, substantial. Of course, we get into debate what is substantial, but you can look at these measures of fit. If that is happening by including such a characteristic, then do it. Uh, the other perspective is here that, that on what is the uncertainty then if you include such a characteristic? And what is the effective number of patients that you base your prediction on eventually? So here we have age and uh, shock. Shock has only 24 uh, men, of, uh, sorry, um, this is just men and women, people with migraine infarction, 24 ha are in shock. So what happens with the predictions? Here we compare a model with and without shock in the model. On the y-axis we have the effective number of patients in the logistic regression model. And on the x-axis, we have the predictions uh, generated from, this, from fitting this model in 1,200 patients. So it's very simple. There's either one variable, age linear, or age plus, plus shock, 0, 1. So what we see here is the red line is age, and on the y-axis, the affected number of patients. On average, was 7% mortality. That are the typical patients. And there we have the highest, say, close to 1,000 patients like you. If your risk profile is age with a result, so without shock or here shock ignoring, then approximately 1,000 are effectively available to make that prediction for you. But if you have a very uh, high risk, say uh, between 20 and 40, the effective number of patients like you is much smaller. And that is both the case if you have the model over here uh, with age included only or shock added to that. So these are patients without shock, they have a lower risk than the, if you ignore that. But the patients with shock, these are the triangles here, they have on typically high risk because it's, it's, and you have a very high likelihood of dying after an acute MI if you're in shock at presentation. So typically around 40%. But patients like you, yeah, we had 24 in total. I didn't read the number specifically, but it's very low. You're very uncertain for these, these people with shock uh, about their prediction. And we see here this, this, this line set, so where the, these were originally, and originally it was just mixed in with the average for the age uh, model, and here if you separate no shock, yes shock, 
then uh, of course this shifts a bit, uh, you have even lower risk or here these are shifted to higher risks. So that's what these lines indicate. So you can look at this graph for quite some time, I, I think, but the key concept is that uh, adding this rare predictor uh, does not affect the, those without shock, because most of them were without shock, but for those with, yes, it, on the one hand you make better predictions, but you have to realize we are very uncertain about it. Now we are not alone, I found out uh, on Google, not chat, GPT, uh, that there is an archive paper, even from people from Amsterdam, with quite similar ideas in the trust or not to trust a regressor, estimating and explaining trustworthiness, so it has it in the title. Uh, so they say, Trustworthiness expresses whether a prediction is aligned with the trained data. So the similarity of your patient. So are you a typical patient or are you very different? And they, they take a distance measure for the new patient, so for new prediction to patients from the training data, and that is trustworthiness combined with whether the prediction the, uh, that you get for the new patient is close to the ground truth in the neighbors in the training set. Well, this is a bit fake to me, but in principle you would say, okay, patients like this patient, the one I'm considering here, and the prediction should also be in the same direction, same ballpark. If that's very different, then yeah, some strange things are happening. Then it would be not trustworthy. They're not from the medical field, they take an economic example with some marketing things, etc. Here's the red line with a instance, they call it a, a case, with a prediction of sales, but the, 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 the examples similar to that are the blue lines, well they are really different, so they would say, well it's not trustworthy, yeah, because the red pattern is really different from what I can find in my training set. So that's a nice idea. And what I do not like about it is this arbitrariness, so you can give it a nice color, red and green, but what, what is this 0 0.09? Well, in our case, uh, what we had here, this is just based on the, well, you have to assume that the model is true, but then it's a standard error of your prediction. So it has a statistical basis there, and you can really calculate there are five patients, 50 patients, 500 patients like you. To me, that is more meaningful. So that's the claim, uh, effective N, the effective number of patients like you, is an attractive concept. And we are taking this further in the, some directions, so one question may be, do you want, say, a minimum, that you cannot give a prediction if you are really unsure, so we would need, for example, 10 patients as a minimum, um, and we can have some tricks and shrinkage approaches and some, some optimization of the model that you achieve that more shrinkage, then you may take them more to the average, so you have a biased prediction, but the certainty is higher. And another question is whether this translates to machine learning, maybe with some bootstrapping that you see the variability in the predictions, and then that gives you kind of standard error which you can translate to this effective number of patients like you. Sounds kind of intuitive. So these are two things to take on further, and there, um, yeah, we have to realize that this effective N is conditional on the model. So I hope you share my enthusiasm for this measure. I think it's really a nice idea. Uh, it's not my own idea, but so that it's easy to be enthusiastic. It was by my, form, my pre predecessor, who is uh, 75 years old, and still, Hans van Houwelingen, still very much in statistics. And, and uh, he was especially uh, aggressive on this 100 patients like you that Mike Tam published. He said, no, that cannot be true. 100 is... So that's why we did this. Okay, so model uncertainty plays up because we condition on the model here, but we know there's more uncertainty. So uh, we had this example of the biologist, which just, was just published last week, and we have the red card problem. In general, there are many papers on comparing machine learning and classic learning. And usually, uh, when people do that, they claim that machine learning is better. Then we did this uh, review, uh, again with Ben Vorkalster from, from Belgium, and we, we claim here in the title, that is the Journal of Clinical Epi style, that there's no performance benefit. So this is for sure making people angry. And indeed, that happened. So on, the, on Twitter, uh, X, there was a lot of uh, this debate. Uh, yeah, um, people who said we, we missed some important papers, etc. Uh, and that is also true because we focused only on the instances where you could make this comparison. So only if a logistic regression model could be used, then we um, uh, could compare to what machine learning achieved there. So uh, that was also one of these comments, and specifically uh, for image analysis and deep learning methods, I fully agree. For image analysis, I don't know how to do a logistic regression. 
So that there is value in alternative approaches there, yes. And the same holds for the language processing. What ChatGPT can do, I don't know. I wouldn't even know where to start with a logistic uh, regression. But in the simple case that you have a relatively small set of x variables, and you want to predict an outcome, yeah, then it's relatively easy to work with logistic or some alternative approach. So are there differences in discrimination? That this was the key table uh, figure from that paper. So here we have the differences in the logit of the AUC um, and the numbers of studies. So several, yeah, quite a substantial body of, of papers did these comparisons. And we separated, that is important, in the low risk of bias versus high risk of bias. And low risk was that it was really an independent validation, so fair comparison between techniques, while high risk of bias was anything where you did something in the data again, like hyperparameters optimized again, or some refitting going on, some recalibration going on. We didn't allow for that. So uh, approximately half were low risk of bias, and there we did not find a difference. You see here that it's really zero between any machine learning and logistic regression. Uh, trees are uh, bad. That also was my impression. It's outdated, so that may be easy to agree on, that the, the classic tree method. Random forest was, was similar, say, uh, support vector machines, uh, ne neural networks. So, uh, yeah, so no, not a clear advantage. That was the main claim of the paper. And I, I think that is generally true. It depends, of course, on the specifics. But um, yeah, we should not really think that regression is, is uh, because it's old, it is outdated. So that was on model uncertainty. Final point on uh, heterogeneity uh, and how to, to look to deal with that from a say biostat perspective. So there may be heterogeneity because of many reasons. The study design may be different from a setting where a model is applied versus uh, where it was developed. The selection may have been different. The disease domain may differ. And there's this challenge if something is developed for adults, but now you're going to apply it also in children, that sort of thing. Measurement of covariates can be different, measurement error, and the outcomes even. If you have mortality, that would not be the case for the outcome, but uh, often there is some measurement error. And that may be different between settings. The associations may differ if we are not really doing bio biology. Huh? So age, I would expect to be generally reflecting biology, but nevertheless, uh, or especially for other characteristics, it may differ. And even for age, if you uh, have some other covariates in the model, like comorbidity, etc. Uh, it's not really the biology that, that we di model directly, so the associations may vary, I fear. And then what we see that the overall outcome rates, even if you adjust for many things, they do systematically differ between settings. So heterogeneity is, is in many aspects. Um, so I, I showed you briefly this neurotrauma model before, and that, that was is, is used here again. It was this, this called impact model, and we published that in 2008. And I was very happy to note that it was really taken up well in the field. It had 56 validations where the discrimination was reported, um, and 31 where calibration was also studied. So, um, yeah, really many people tried to, uh, to check, to, to test this model, to uh, go for, assess the validity. But what is worrisome is that the mean may be okay. Yeah? So I, we had originally something like 0 0.78, 0 0.80, that the mean of all these validations shows that it's, it's not that bad, and that's explainable because we were used something like 8,000 patients to develop the model, so it was yeah, robust. The calibration slope is also around one, and intercept on average, so the average risk was uh, minus, so apparently slightly better outcomes now than predicted. So that's also plausible in time that, that people are having better results than what we published in 2008 with data that were even older, of course. But what is worrying is, of course, this range, so AUC range, and especially calibration slope, 0.4 to 2, and this intercept, really minus 3. So if you think about it, that's in the logistic context, so exponent minus 3, so that's something like minus, uh, minus 27 or so. Uh, odds ratio, 7, 1 divided by 27 odds ratio. So predictions far too high for some setting. Maybe there's some measurement, so some, some uncertainty in that, but the range is really disturbing. So heterogeneity in uh, performance is, is what we uh, have, and that, yeah, that, uh, calibration is important for the patient, so, so you would be really off with your predictions. So we did uh, look at that in more detail in this paper. There's a final point I will present. Uh, how to assess heterogeneity if you have data, individual patient data, 
participant data for prediction modeling. And so we have now 11, 15 initially, 11, now 15 studies. Here are the names and different times and different types, trials or observational studies and really substantial numbers. So we look first for heterogeneity in the case mix. How different are these, these, these data sets? So here are 15 data sets on the x-axis. Age, well, yeah, there are some differences. These are really older than the other cohorts. Distribution in other characteristics that are in these models. Differences are there. More important, heterogeneity in the predictor effects. So intercept here is age. So age, as I said, generally I would hope that is close to biology, but nevertheless these effects, and this is adjusted for all the other characteristics, is really different here. It's really very strong, also confidence interval outside of what we get with the random effect summary here. So yeah, there is quite some heterogeneity, and if we look for more statistical measures like Tau here that for pupils that is here in the upper right, there was most heterogeneity and this hypotension here. This was also statistically quite different. Nevertheless, we, we take kind of the average effect as kind of the best guess usually. Finally, that, and this was a the kind of novel, I've not seen this often, that you can compare the predictions you get from each from model fitted in each data set and compared to the others. So we have 15 data sets, so th these are shown here uh, against each other. So to clarify, study one, study two, so the same model is fitted. Hey, these are rather similar, close to 45 degree line if you just calculate the predictions on the full data sets. So for 11,000 patients, 11,000 points here, uh, these are similar. And that's explainable again because this is a Trilizat trial which was run uh, internationally, so with Europe and uh, some other countries, and in the US. So these are the same protocol, same design, really similar studies. But if you go to study three or four here, there's these bands happening, so apparently discrete variables have different effects. So you see quite some differences. Uh, and this is a zero to 100% scale. And so there's a lot of uncertainty by going to another data set. Well, we can formally also examine that a bit in more detail, that we start with a model, and this is actually the most formula-rich slide, and this is just a logistic uh, model overall, so we uh, predict outcome Y based on the set of X's, and it has one intercept alpha and a set of uh, beta coefficients for the X variables, so the linear predictor. So and then we get this H here, prediction there, and the confidence interval is very small. Right? because we have 11,000 patients, so we are really sure if you have this age and you take some average values for the other covariate, yeah, uh, I am in 56, so I put myself here, ah, I know what my risk is. Right? It's just limited uncertainty. But now if I go to a model with a normal distribution for the intercepts, so the heterogeneity in the, between studies in the average risk is modeled, then I say, oh, it depends very much in which data and which context you are. Right? This, this, this average Prediction is still there, approximately, but there is a lot of uncertainty. And I can do it in more nuance. We're also having this uh, slope of the linear predictor. So there is this gamma here having a distribution. Then we get even more uncertainty, but uh, I would say it's more or less similar. Or just say, well, let me put um, a, a distribution on all the coefficients. So everything may be different by data set. And then, yeah, then it depends very much, of course, which data set, which context you are and the uncertainty is, is really large. Eh? So for 56 years, between 20% and 50 or so. So tremendous uncertainty, unfortunately, if we take this perspective of, hey, there may be heterogeneity between contacts, between settings. So some things uh, to conclude are, are under our influence as, as modelers. Uh, what we really should do as a first step is really aim for large sample size. And that's a direction, especially with AI, that is being followed. And usually data sets are really much larger than when I made my model in 1988. So that's a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, what is maybe not so good is I really like modest modeling. Be, uh, be conservative, uh, use subject knowledge, and um, yeah, then we know what we're doing and we should limit the flexibility. I think that is a better chance of more generalizability of these predictions, more trustworthy predictions. There's something that are not on our, in our influence, like heterogeneity, but we should at least be transparent about that and then and, and show these, these differences so that they may be in the study design, they may be in the distribution effects of the covariates, 
sorry, and and um, and then eventually in these differences between predictions, which we can examine in this uh, idea of plotting predictions from one study to another. So overall, the, these predictions, if you bring them to the, to the clinic, if you bring them to patients, then we have to realize that they suffer from really from multiple sources of uncertainty. So uh, yeah, the question may be, to what extent do we want to be transparent? And maybe if we are very transparent, nobody will use our models. If I say to a patient, hey, your risk, my risk was 30%, but actually we're not so sure. It may be between 20 and 50. And then, oh, yeah, well, that's a pro And then to another patient who is really exceptional, you say, well, your risk may be between 10 and 90. And say, yeah, that is close to zero and 100%. So, uh, so is there a limit to that? And, um, and it relates to also to a point that is increasingly recognized, especially also in the AI world, on local models versus global models, where we have something that is a sepsis model that would be universally <laughs> applicable throughout the US versus you need something specific for Michigan, for New York, for every place in, in, in the US. And uh, well, you may want to comment on that famous example. Uh, but there they started with a global model, right? And that was not valid, it was maybe doing harm in some settings. So uh, that is the bigger debate uh, related to all this. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really a pleasure to think about this and present this here. So I look forward to the further discussion. Thank you so much. So we have some time for discussion and questions. Um, and I certainly have questions I can ask, but I'll first look to the group to say, uh, does anyone have questions that you would like to ask? Feel free to just raise your hand. Yeah, one second. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. Um, so I was struck during your talk about um, sort of a, a philosophical almost definition of like trustworthiness and trust and the process through which we develop the models and then the place in which, the setting in which you use the model. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit towards, because I, my, my feeling, I guess not to sort of tip your answer, is that there may be trustworthy processes that develop models that, may, you, that you may want to trust in certain settings, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts yeah. on this. No, uh, I, I like the way you frame this issue of an indeed trustworthiness as a, as a concept. Well, what do we really mean with that? Huh? So, um, so, so the co maybe it sometimes helps to reverse. Uh, so, so I say I don't want to have misleading models. Uh, so, like, like, and it can also be not per se for a prediction, but uh, starting with an association like the red card study, that study that said. I know it's 0.17 and there's no uncertainty, that is a misleading result. And as scientists, we should not accept that. Right? So that, um, and we should realize that, so that, that, it, that uh, if you read the internet and these things like science is in crisis, that would contribute to that, making too strong claims. So I, I guess that we need to be yeah, more open about uh, the uncertainties we have in all these aspects, sample size, but also the choices we make as modelers and then the context uh, that models are applied, um, that we are, yeah, we are not really certain, we make best guesses. Um, but I'm struggling myself also, but maybe there's more for true philosophers to, to say how we should define trustworthiness. And, uh, should, should at least not be a misleading with certainty. Just a question, can you comment a little bit on, on whether you think there's value or dangers in you know, giving confidence intervals or measures of variation about a risk estimate itself when the underlying truth is binary? Yeah, that, that, that's a big debate. So there is, uh, so Mike Catan, my, my, my friend from Cleveland, who uh, had this uh, 100 patients like you uh, statement, uh, he had a paper like a uh, comment, commentary in a journal of urology or so on uh, doc what are my chances and then he does this kind of interview with his father coming to the clinic, having prostate cancer and talking with him, and he's going to give a confidence interval, and the father leaves in full confusion, uh, because this issue that yeah uh, you give, there's this primary uncertainty, it's a probability, we don't really know if you give you 10%, it's on average 10 out of 100. That level of uncertainty is already difficult, aleatory uncertainty to understand, and then we come with epistemic uncertainty on top of that. So for patients, it may be really hard. 
On the other hand, I think it's also really for psychologists how to communicate risk. I think if I get a weather prediction with these lines of chances of rain, in the Netherlands at least, I have an app that shows it with 10, 30% and a confidence interval, a band around it, some band, so they don't literally say what it's 95% confidence, because by the way, nobody would be able to really frame that what a 95% confidence interval is, except Jeremy, of course. But, uh, <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, I was thinking about the world of clinical trials, which are you know, A versus B comparisons and only similar in some ways uh, to, uh, to model development and the, and the way you were discussing it. Uh, in the late 20th century, there was a rise, the Cochrane Collaboration, which basically uh, assumed there would be all kinds of variability in clinical trials and basically saying that we really shouldn't trust any one trial yep. and we should use methods of meta-analysis to uh, basically build our confidence in whether A is better than B or B is better than A or it really makes no difference. Can you comment on differences in modeling versus clinical trials yeah. and how we might be thinking differently uh, yeah. about these two areas. Uh, that's an excellent point. It's a really very important. It was raised by uh, André Klotneerdes, who was a chair of the Health Council, and I present, we were visiting him with a thesis from a student of mine, and he asked the same question. So it's, well, why is it that, that there's always this discussion, or similar question at least, this discussion about validation and prediction while in a trial? Well. Um, yeah, we have the Cochrane collaboration, so what's the mindset difference? So at least the, the, the main parameter in the trial, I guess, is the treatment effect estimator. And as you framed it, also, is it beneficial, is it neutral, or harmful? <laughs> and that is kind of easier task, I guess. So we accept that there is variability between the trials, and well, we made this change. I'm old enough to still know that we started with uh, their Simone and Laird fixed effect. And then now everybody's doing random effect, and that's kind of accepting the between study variability, better from a statistical perspective, I guess. Um, but nevertheless, we're still aiming for this, say, qualitative answer, what's the order of magnitude, maybe, but especially, is it beneficial? If you look for the Cochrane um, reviews, they're very nuanced and detailed about inclusion of the evidence and their lengthy reports. But eventually, I think it still comes down to, yeah, is this a beneficial treatment? Um, the challenge may be uh, related to that and how to translate this Cochrane average kind of claim to the individual. And that is especially with David Kent from, from Boston. We wrote this past statement on what we can do within trials, uh, especially not go for too many subgroup checks, because that, that to me is just the minefield where we have all kinds of false positives and uh, just not, not sufficient power is the main issue in, in, in for subgroup effects. While if you make a prediction model, so that brings us to, to my talk, prediction model to estimate the baseline risk without a treatment and then accept the treatment effect uh, is supposed to be beneficial, uh, then of course those this low risk have little to gain and those at high risk generally have much to gain, assuming a constant effect, a relatively constant effect for, for the treatment. So then there is a kind of marriage between the um, treatment from a trial and um, how you translate it to the individual patient. And you can also use an a observational data set, like, like in breast cancer, there's this famous PREDICT study. They have a website where the baseline risk is estimated from observational data, from cancer registries, 100,000 women with breast cancer, and the treatment effects from uh, trials from the Cochrane Library. Um, and the final point, I think, on, on so whether we after one parameter, essentially in the trial context, versus this combination of typically five to 10, and in, in the AI world, maybe hundreds of variables, uh, and then come up, with, come up with one single prediction, which is really multidimensional in, in the basis, that makes it for a really harder task. That, uh, almost as hard that I am now old enough to say, hmm, should we even do this? <laughs> Hi, uh, good question. So I totally appreciate the importance of generalizability and its ability to externally validate 
Uh, but just wondering that, you know, in situations, there are situations where one might argue that why aren't you building a model for the population that you're actually most likely to deliver it in? For example, you know, uh, Karandeep has shown that a veterans, you know, veterans Affairs model will not generalize outside the VA or will be miscalibrated outside the VA. But if you're building models specifically for veterans, uh, yeah. why not aim for that as your primary endpoint? Primarily because they are a population of interest, predominantly male. Um, and may have features that are just most applicable uh, to them. You know, there's also other arguments that, you know, sometimes people will externally validate to what we perceive as the gold standard, which, which is a randomized control trial. But we also know that the randomized control trial is specifically selected. You know, you're missing out on the older age population. Uh, there's yep. so many exclusion criteria. So just uh, maybe a comment on that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so this, this local uh, validity, say, in. Uh, yeah, so for AI, uh, we did a, when there's sufficient data, then I guess that, that it's probably quite sensible to make something for your local setting. Just develop it, do some checks for not too much overfit. So, so you, and then you have a reasonable model. So we did that for a, uh, a discharge destination from the ICU. Uh, it was trained on something like 50,000 patients from Amsterdam. Well, reasonable number. Um, but uh, when we tested, validated that in Leiden, we again at 50,000, and yeah, the predictions were quite off, and it was XG boost. Well, I don't really know how to update that in a subtle way, so we just refit it. Again, XG boost with a similar set of variables, and we have the model for Leiden. So in that case, th 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 that works out, and but yeah, but it's a bit fatiguing if every hospital has to do that, right? <laughs> that, that if you go not Amsterdam, Leiden, go to Utrecht, go to Rotterdam, I go to all the big cities, I go to Belgium, I, all over Europe, I may want to go to the US. Then we would have this. You would hope that there is kind of this family of models which has underlying a global model. So um, that that is a challenge in, in, to define similarity between settings. So uh, and my experiences have been negative. That I tried, for example, in this uh, neurotrauma example, like okay, maybe these uh, observational studies are really different from the trials. And yes, that you could group them as eleven versus four, but it's really hard to. To, to clarify where these, what, what the measure for similarity would be, it is outside the covariates, because the covariates are in the model. So that also makes it really puzzling. Hi. So, uh, one, thank you for this really interesting presentation, and um, chat, the chat GPT stuff was, was really, really cool. Um, I, have, I have a very weird distinction of being someone who chat GPT had a hallucination about, and got got published not myself, but someone else wrote about the uh, hallucination ChatGPT had about me. So okay. they, they asked ChatGPT about learning health systems, and ChatGPT said, um, Josh Rubin, the thought leader in learning health systems, and here are all the stuff he said that I've never said. Okay, <laughs> so, anyway, okay. so it made up um, the things. So it made up a bunch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then by me, and they made it. But anyway, um, so the question I have, so to me, the ultimate goal of these studies of trustworthiness yeah. comes to this factor of trust. So ideally, things that are really trustworthy, you want to be trusted, and things that aren't too trustworthy, you don't want to be trusted and vice versa. Yeah. Have there been really good studies about what people trust and what they don't trust? And are they trusting the trustworthy things? Or are they not trusting the not trustworthy things? And yeah. how do we get that sort of diagonal line better? We, you know, so we want, a good world has that diagonal line very, very smooth. It's they trust things that trust, are trustworthy, they don't trust things that aren't. Yes. Now, so that was one of the things that uh, I found this was only a, a draft, but that I advertised it for them. So these, um, research from, from Amsterdam, that they, they presented this graphic, and, and they, they say this was one way to, uh, that also users, non-experts in statistics, they would understand that this is not trustworthy. The red line is different from the blue lines. There's nothing similar to this instance, that, that's what they said. Um, so that is then to identify the non-trustworthy, and you said also the other side, that maybe that's interesting. Eh? So when is it trustworthy? Yeah, I am speculating now, but if you think about, say, the framing and model, that was with really very learned scientists from Harvard and Boston University involved. It was actually just a village in Massachusetts, but okay, but they made up framing and it was a lot of need for it. I also have another example from the Manchester triage system that was made up by uh, experts. Uh, Karen Deep and I would be sitting in a garden in Manchester with some other clinicians around us, and they would come up with, hey, what would be a good way to classify urgency? And they say, oh, highly urgent, you're bleeding, you're not breathing. And I'm, oh, yeah, I agree. And that system had five layers and five colors, and they made a nice booklet with it. There was no empirical data, and it was implemented all over Europe as a kind of prioritization system. 
Manchester triage system. Mm. So one of the points I love that you made was the uncertainty about uncertainty. And um, there's this uh, very famous XKCD comic where Randall Monroe shows uh, you know, an error bar, and then he shows an error bar around the error bar, and an error bar around the error bar around the error bar. He says, you know, I don't know how to calculate errors, so I just draw error bars on all my error bars. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But, uh, and so this notion that you have a challenge communicating a prediction interval to a patient, for example, yeah. makes a lot of sense. One of the ways in which people, I think, have started to use that concept of what is reinvented in machine learning as conformal prediction yeah. is that if you have a really wide prediction interval, then you don't rely on the prediction at all. Yeah. So, you know, if you told someone your risk of prostate cancer is 5%, but the error bar is from one to 99, yeah. Sure, you could confuse them by telling them the prediction interval, but they could also look you in the eye and say, well, why would you trust that at all? Why, yeah. why are we even talking about this if it's so wide? So any thoughts you have around yeah. you know, prediction interval as a source of reliability of that prediction, maybe we should just throw it out and not even look at it. Yeah. It's too wide. Yeah. No, so I do, do like the, 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 this idea, and uh, indeed it is also this motivation for, for our statistical approach to come up with some modeling procedure, because what's the alternative then? Eh? If you say 5%, but I cannot give it to you because it's so uncertain, then, then, then is it then the average? Or I've never seen a patient like you, so I don't know. And then, I mean, you have to, yeah, I don't know. So, so, so the trick might be to say 5% uh, would be really uncertain, but uh, the, the, the average would be certain, but then, yeah, we, you're just, you are a member of the group, so in that sense, the average is not that strange. To come up with something in between, which is essentially what shrinkage does, and it pulls predictions to the average. So conceptually, I think that is an, an option. And then you, then you have bias in the prediction, but more certainty, and then you can say, well, it's in between the three, and uh, we don't know where the number will be, say typically more to the average. So say 10% risk is now my best guess, and that is between uh, three and, and 20% or so. Thanks yeah. for, uh, for, thank you for the, the great talk. Um, I, I wanted to see if you could just talk a little more about the explainability aspect. Um, just kind of thinking, like zooming out, thinking about this from a more uh, just general point of view um, of how I, would tr how I would build trust for another human being. Um, <laughs> generally, the process I would use is, uh, you know, I would look at their prior performance. Yeah. Um, you know, have they, have they gotten the right answer um, when people ask them questions? Are they able to perform a task you know, intelligently, accurately? I would also want to see what their methodology is. And it's yeah. essentially me like yeah. trying to understand how yeah. they go about solving a problem. Yeah. So is this, I think you, you touched on this a little bit, but is the explainability part, like how much of a key do you think that is? Or, yeah, or not no, I like your reasoning on explainability and uh, I think in the, uh, in the modeling world, in the classical world, maybe we expand a bit. Uh, in the classical world, there's, there's this, this debate. Huh? So uh, some people are really angry that you dichotomized your predictors or you did not look for nonlinearity at all. And, and so the model development process is important for trustworthiness. And the other school would say, I don't care. You were these Manchester people having a cup of tea in England, and you came up with this great system. I'm just looking whether it, the validity is OK. When I check it in data, do these predictions uh, are well calibrated and have some discrimination in it. So that there's the two schools there for trustworthiness. Perhaps both are important. As you actually also said, you would look at how it was developed. So. Um, yeah, so to, and then you need to have trust in that if I use, say, XG Boost, I don't know exactly how it works, to be tr uh, really open here. But nevertheless, some people with a lot of mathematical background and fancy reasoning, they made up this method and it is, yeah, it has shown to be okay in other situations, so I use it, something like that. So the trustworthiness of the development part. Um, yeah, and you were also alluding to some nice things uh, further on, yeah, so the broad thing, development and validation, maybe, can you, you there were some other issues you mentioned that were. Yeah, so like there's essentially, like just in terms of how I would, how I would build trust for another 
Yeah, based on past performance. That was, that was then you also mentioned. Yes, yeah. So that that is also interesting. The difficulty I want to remark on that is past performance for predictions, which are inherently uh, just probabilities, is difficult. It comes to this this, um, this calibration property. Then that they say, oh, often I said 10 percent, and it was 10 out of 100. That now again I see I give you a risk of 10 percent for a fully different covariance pattern. Do I still have trust that that is again uh, on average 10 out of 100? So, so the uniqueness that is this reference class problem that many people bring up in the, fo the fundamental problem of causal inference. They say, ah, you can never observe, treat someone, and not, not treat one. Eh? The fundamental problem of causal inference. I think there's similarly a fundamental problem in prediction in general with probabilities. We can never observe that true probability. Uh, I have a question for you on heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. So you in two settings, you talked about pooled models or global models yeah. versus local models as being one kind of how heterogeneous the settings are might determine whether yeah. local is better than global. The other one is, I think, um, when you take a model from somewhere else and you evaluate it at your, at your place, yeah. you know, you might find that it does totally fine or you might find that it does really poorly. And I guess some of what I've heard is from people is that has to do a lot with what uh, the relationships, or even just some of the table one characteristics of your data set versus their data set, yes. some of that has to do with sample size. Yeah. Do you think there is a way to anticipate, without actually going through the entire exercise, whether a model is going to generalize to a setting based yeah. at least on, maybe you can't say it's going to, but you could say it's definitely not going to, based on just observed yes. differences in table one, or again, that a, a, a global model just simply isn't going to work. Yes, that's a great point again. I think, yeah, so, so applying something in a, in a new setting, how can we have some, some confidence or anticipate the trustworthiness? Eh? So I tried to do that here with, with these differences between settings. And uh, we, we could, not, could not find obvious relations with, say, the validity of a model uh, for a particular setting looking at the covariate distribution. Uh, these, but these are covariates that are in the model. Right, so, so it's also taken care of in, in some sense. Um, no, so the short answer would be no. I, I don't know how to do that really. Um, I think you, intuitively, yes, if your case mix in the observed covariates that are in the model, but it's very different from the development setting, then yeah, that the trustworthiness is lower. That is the, was the reasoning in this uh, paper I just showed with the red line. And the case is really different. So um, that should probably make us um, skeptical about uh, trustworthiness. Um, I, hello, I had a follow-up on that based on heterogeneity or even just going back to an earlier point you made about, you know, if like the confidence interval goes from 1 to 0.99 and, you know, if, if you like as a like physician would recommend that the average, but what if that person that you, you're like, that's sitting before you was actually not even, because that average had to come from somewhere, right? Yes. Like yeah. what if they're not even in the, considered in the population? That, yeah, excellent for point. For that average, so like how do we move forward for that since this talk is about, you know, like applying it to the individual? Yes, now so this exceptionality of a patient is, is an issue that in the, in the end we are just extrapolating. We have never seen such a patient, but so strictly speaking, I think any patient that comes up, and especially with continuous covariates, it's rare that you have a very, really identical uh, patient like that before. Uh, so you have to rely on some modeling assumptions, some, some general structure there. But yes, this extrapolation is bringing it to the extreme that, that uh, and for some very situation that may be quite obvious that you never saw a patient like that, so you, you cannot tell. Yeah. So I think I'll take one final question. Yeah. Yes, so, so you talked a little about AUC and not being a very good metric, and so I guess maybe there's two questions here. So do you have a, be a suggestion for something better than AUC? And yeah. Actually, I think it somewhat addresses Karandeep's question about can you tell ahead of time from table one that it might not be good. So AUC depends on the spread of the covariates correct, in the data. Correct. So if you have a distribution which is very tight, it's going to be hard to discriminate, so you will get a a smaller AUC, just yes. up front, and you have to expect yep. that. And so True. that's sort of a negative feature of AUC, but it's also a way to look ahead of time. Don't, don't expect to trust AUC. Yes. Now, so fully agree, of course, that, that this AUC is dependent on the distribution of the covariates. So if that's a more heterogeneous setting, then you expect a higher 
sea statistic. We have, we have a, there's actually for survival this Gunn and Heller statistic, which is uh, we, we generalize that to say the model-based C that is just calculating the anticipated C statistic given your case mix. So if the model is fully correct, what would it be? It's a kind of reference. Um, and yes, uh, if you have a more homogeneous uh, setting, then the C statistic will be lower. But the trustworthiness might in both instances be okay or off, right? Because that's really the reliability of the predictions. So even with the limited set. And going beyond AUC, uh, that is in the title of a famous paper by uh, Michael Pensina in Statistics and Medicine, going beyond AUC, and then he proposed a net reclassification index for marker research, um, which has been criticized later on. I think it should not be used anymore, I think. But for uh, the alternative is what Andrew Vickers and also Pendy We actually on. had Michael Pensina here a few months ago. Okay, he's, right he's a great person. Person, but I said to him, I said to him, literally, this was a historical mistake. So okay, anyway, um, and I would agree. Probably the paper itself is good, but the use is really off. So um, anyway, uh, for for the better than AUC, I think uh, really that uh, this, this weighting the consequences of a decision, which is the net benefit, is the way forward. And there are also in the machine learning world quite some some papers already in that direction with cost functions and that sort of thing. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our speaker. Please, let's give our speaker a round of applause. Just a closing thing, which is that our next uh, collaboratory is going to be November 21st. Where uh, is he? Dr. Akbar Walji is going to be presenting uh, Learning Without Borders, AI's Dual Path, and Veterans and Global Health. Great. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Randy. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. That's why when you, when you told me you were going to be on campus, I said, no, no, you, you have to get a talk, right? I'm just like, get a slide on campus. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. Alfred, I hope you, you guys find it very difficult to make it. But I think it's just, you can see what that's like. I think that's the right view, but just exactly right view. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, have fun at your dinner but it will not necessarily be zero or oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. I am like, 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 yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>